Good morning, good afternoon, uh, uh, good evening. Uh, uh, welcome to this uh, first session of uh, the Global Landscape Forum uh, Biodiversity. And <clears throat> we are going to discuss a, a very important topic, uh, which is about uh, how do we mainstream uh, biodiversity in a very important uh, productive sector, which is forestry, and uh, even more important in the case because forestry is very much dependent on biodiversity also. So we have a, a very distinguished uh, set of panelists. Um, and <clears throat> uh, the session is a bit tight. So the, the, there is quite a lot to hear about. So I'll try to keep myself short and, and keep everybody else uh, sticking to their time. And, and I will start uh, without further ado uh, by asking uh, uh, Mete Wilkie, uh, as the director of forestry in FAO, and <clears throat> FAO that has just adopted an ambitious uh, strategy for mainstreaming biodiversity across the agricultural sector, uh, how do you see uh, mainstreaming biodiversity in the forestry sector in FAO? Mete. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you joining us from around the world. It's a great pleasure to be with you, with you here today. And yes, as you said, we adopted a strategy on mainstreaming biodiversity across the agricultural sectors uh, less than a year ago in support of the discussions within the Convention on Biological Diversity. And we're currently finalizing an action plan for what we want to do with this over the next three years. When it comes to forests, we all know that they are home to the vast majority of terrestrial biodiversity. So it's absolutely imperative that we mainstream biodiversity within the forest sector. Uh, fortunately, this is something that all governments around the world have formally recognized as important. Back in 2007, they adopted what was called the non-legally binding instrument for all types of forests. And that instrument defined biodiversity as one of just seven. All right, and we had a small glitch already. I am talking to you from home. My connection is not fantastic. No worries. But anyway, we left at seven. Say, right, seven elements of the concept of sustainable forest management which is also enshrined in the UN Strategic Sustainable Development Goals 15. So biodiversity is part of sustainable forest management. And I really have some good news to tell you here today. Globally, if we look at it, 18% of the world's forest area, or more than 700 million hectares, are located within legally established protected areas according to the Global Forest Resources Assessment 2020, which uh, FAO just released earlier this year. And this means that for forests as a whole, we have already surpassed the IG biodiversity target 11 to protect at least 17% of terrestrial area by 2020. But we of course need to look at biodiversity conservation outside protected areas as well. And let me just give you three examples of what we're doing in FAO in that regard. I think you have all read about how the population of bees and other pollinators are rapidly declining. And many of these live in and around forest. And that's why we at FAO in June this year published a study that we undertook together with Bioversity International on the pollination services of forest. It looked at the impacts of forest and landscape management practices on pollinators and it provided a number of case studies and some very practical examples and recommendations on how we can maintain pollinator diversity and abundance in forests and landscapes. But of course, it's not just the small animals that are disappearing from our forest. And we have another program that's called the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program that's uh, implemented in collaboration with C4, with the Wildlife Conservation Society and the French Agricultural Research Center for International Development, which aims at improving the conservation of wildlife in 13 tropical countries and at the same time improve food security. And you will hear much more about that today and tomorrow. But let me just give you one last example 
Um, we recently completed a project funded by the Global Environment Facility in Mongolia um, that was called Mainstreaming Biodiversity Conservation, Sustainable Forest Management and Carbon Sink Enhancement into Mongolia's Productive Forest Landscapes. And this project worked with over 100 forest user groups to help develop forest management plans that include biodiversity conservation objectives and implemented activities to enhance forest health, productivity, the carbon stocks and the income from forests. And I think that solutions that balance conservation and sustainable use of forest sector are critical and possible. And that's exactly what mainstreaming biodiversity in the forest sector is all about. And that's what I had to say, Robert. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we are in spite of the glitches. Now we are moving to a very another very important player in, in the biodiversity, which is the, the Convention of Biological Diversity. And uh, Alexander, as the director of the division for the on the Convention of Biological Diversity, and, and given the the forthcoming uh, 2020 uh, post post 2020 strategy. What what do you expect for the forestry sector in in the CBD? Good morning, thank you, Robert, and uh, hello, colleagues. It's a pleasure to speak to you all today. So we know that uh, this past year has been a difficult one for everyone and for forests and certainly for people. While we have been uh, grappling with the effects of a pandemics, so forests have continued to disappear at an accelerated pace. And the two issues are far from being disconnected. So fires of an unprecedented scale have engulfed hectares and hectares of forests in Australia, in Russia, in California, and Brazil. And experts have pointed to the linkages between deforestation and the emergence of the new zoonotic diseases, such as COVID-19. The scientists also pointing to the heightened risk and worsening severity of COVID-19 infections in those exposed to air pollution and to the impact of smoke from forest fires. This year, 2020, marks the end of the UN decade on biodiversity and the conclusion of uh, our strategic plan for biodiversity 2011-2020. And this decade's, decade has seen remarkable progress in actions to conserve biodiversity, but also to promote its sustainable use. Yet, as shown by the recent release of the fifth edition of the Global Biodiversity Outlook, these efforts, unfortunately, are still widely insufficient to bend the curve of biodiversity loss, including loss of forests. While deforestation has slowed in places, we are still far from reaching the objective to halt it completely. Depleted biodiversity, unsustainable wildlife trade, deforestation and forest degradation create health and safety risks that hit the already poor and disadvantaged the hardest. The new post-2020 global biodiversity framework we are working on now with all our parties aims to stabilize and reverse trends in biodiversity loss for the next 10 years by 2030 and allow for the recovery of natural ecosystems in the following 20 years with net improvements by 2050 to achieve the vision of living in harmony with nature. And the new framework is covering a number of areas relevant to forests and actually mainstreaming uh, forest into our biodiversity discussion. Whether we are talking about increase of area connectivity and integrity of natural ecosystems, and this is an ambition for 2030. And we believe it is very much in line also with other globally agreed goals such as UN strategic plan on forests. We also believe that the full engagement of what we usually call forest sector will be absolutely crucial to achieve these goals. But the linkages between our productive systems and forests run very deep and the forestry sector as well as other economic sectors will also need to decouple the supply chains from commodities directly or indirectly 
linked to deforestation and biodiversity loss. Deforestation free commodity trade requires enhanced traceability and better supply chain data. Bilateral and multilateral agreements asserted with clear environmental safeguards and awareness of uh, end consumers and efforts to curb overall demand in certain products. And it's also very much linked to the reform of subsidies and incentives currently in place, including in the forestry sector. And that's what the new global uh, biodiversity framework will touch upon as well. All these solutions will need to be deployed at scale, including in a post-pandemic recovery package, among other new programs, policies, and financial thinking. So, that we can reach the goals of the new global biodiversity framework. This is the spirit of building maybe not just back, but way much better than we had before for biodiversity and for people to create a shift towards more inclusive and sustainable economies and societies in line with the vision of living in harmony with nature. Societies where hopefully People still have you need to conclude, Alexander. For us to go. Thank you, Robert. That was okay. Adelaide. Fantastic. Thank Thanks, and 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 then we we move to to another very important region for for biodiversity, the, the Congo Basin, and and uh, Gervais, as, as the deputy executive secretary of the Comifac, uh, what do you see the role of uh, regional uh, organization uh, such as the COMIFAC in terms of promoting and, and supporting biodiversity mainstreaming in the forestry sector. So thank you, Robert, and good morning, colleagues, all conservators in the world. So um, it's a great uh, opportunity for us to share our experience uh, from this uh, GLF. So we want, of course, to start to emphasize the importance of biodiversity for the well-being of humanity and local population. And as well, in our region, we think that this potentiality, the biodiversity potential not used uh, properly. <clears throat> and when we come up with the uh, importance of regional institutions on mainstreaming biodiversity or try to, uh, to push this aspect, it's important to check uh, the importance of these organizations in the area where they're playing for. When we talk uh, for COMIFAC, for instance, it's important to call up that uh, uh, COMIFAC, it's born from an important initiative from head of state and head of government of Central Africa countries and they recognize the importance of preserving on sustainable management of forest resources in our region as well. Our leader think that uh, people need to uh, rely on these resources to improve the, 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 the well-being. Uh, for instance, to have uh, this one in our region, our minister in charge of forest sector uh, develop and prepare what we call uh, a convergence plan for our region. And this convergence plan allow uh, COMIFAC to be this kind of uh, important institutions on forestry and environment in our region. And this, and, and this way, COMIFAC, for instance, publish this kind of uh, uh, directive on guidelines on issue of uh, biodiversity, for instance. And then this one, we can see if we have these international recommendations or, or guidelines, it's important to come in the regional level to try to have this kind of indicators at regional level. And it's clear that COMIFAC played this kind of role to try to bring this international recommendation and global process, for instance, uh, UNFF, uh, FAO, Biodiversity Convention, and so on try to bring this one and to traduce this one on directive and strategy for our sub-region. And this will allow uh, our countries to try to interrelate this one in the inter internal regulation in country level. For instance, we can have this kind of 
uh, strategies for central region, uh, central Africa countries that does on, on EPA uh, resources. And we can have as well, uh, we can talk as well about directive on use of uh, uh, on non timber forest product as well uh, a, a guide on how we build on uh, creation of protected area in the region as well an on directive on on trainings in forests and environmental in our country all this one uh, we can take up up with the creation of the OFAC as a forest observatory in Central Africa. And this one, we can as well have this forest observatory on protected area in Africa, will produce regularly this kind of document of reference in the region, calling state of forest in Central Africa, state of protected area in Central Africa. And as you can say, this kind of document of production can help right, the, 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 the important role that uh, regional organization like COMIFI can play uh, in order to mainstream biodiversity in the forest sector. And it's as well if some challenges can be addressed and this work can be increased. Thank you, Robert. Merci beaucoup, Gervais, and, and thanks for the effort of doing this in the very good English and sticking to the time, fantastic. Now, now we move to also a very important player in, in, in this uh, forestry, uh, I would say the game, it's uh, <coughs> Bart Sorel, which is the, the Director General of NOAD. And, and we know the, the role that NOAD played in, in, in Red Plus and, and the preservation in forest for climate change mitigation. But how to integrate biodiversity management in, in broad forest conservation objective? And do, do we need something for biodiversity that is a bit like Red Plus? And, and what is the role of Red Plus in biodiversity conservation? So, what? Well. Thank you so much, uh, Robert, and, and thanks for having me and good to see you all. Um, you know, like we all know, uh, we, mankind, totally uh, rely on nature for food, for... Um, uh, medicine, for clothes, for energy, for everything. And it's not really like we need nature. It, it's more like we are part of nature. It's inherent in everything we are and do. Um, and forests, like we also know, are is a particularly important part of this. Forests are also their key safety net for the poorest segments of the population. Millions and millions of people live within our forests, and of course, they are extremely important uh, uh, for carbon storage and for biodiversity, whether it be the tropical forests of the world or, or the boreal forests of the world. Uh, one example of which you can see behind me uh, from Norway uh, this uh, summer. And this was pretty much the backdrop. Uh, when Norway in 2007 launched uh, the Norwegian International Climate and Forest Initiative, NICFI, uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, the COP, the climate COP in Bali. Uh, and it was very much a climate initiative for sure, but it also had a more underlying philosophical question behind it uh, when we uh, discussed and, uh, whether to involve, which was this. What can we do to make trees more worth living than dead? Because we very much know the price of trees cut down. Uh, it can be measured in the market price of timber and the, and the outrot from them. But we also, of course, fundamentally now, but for this planet, it is much more valuable in so many terms to retain uh, and, and keep our forests around the world. So what can we do to actually value what we know we need to protect? Um, uh, and then um, uh, this was uh, one initiative. It was uh, uh, within the framework of, of Red Plus, like you all know. Um, last year, uh, the Norwegian parliament decided to extend uh, the NICFI program at the present levels, at least until 2030. Uh, 
uh, first is about uh, a long term is about the long term uh, so therefore it was also important to to think in the long term about nikfi but there was it was uh, there was done a, an important strategic adjustment, which was putting more emphasis on protection of diversity in addition to combating climate change into the main thinking uh, of the program. Thus, uh, uh, from um, now on, um, the uh, NICFI is about protecting natural forests, both to combat climate change but also to protect our natural habitat and the biodiversity in it themselves. Uh, and, and this is, will be, I think, gradually an important strategic adjustment. Uh, of course, um, many of the things that has been done already through NICFI has had this double effect or, or, um, or emphasis. But it mean, will, uh, will mean also from now on that programs directly uh, uh, meant to support uh, particularly vul vulnerable biodiversity spots will be more important. It means that we will engage more in the uh, con uh, on, in the convention for uh, biodiversity, not only in the through the climate convention. It means that other kind of project and so on will have uh, more support, and we would like to work with our partners around the world uh, to to change the emphasis of the thinking in this direction, not to leave out combating climate change, but to add uh, a more uh, a, a, a holistic biodiversity component in the forest work. Thank you so far. Thank you very much. I think that you have uh, interested a lot of people in this talk. I, mean, I see people are... Mm. Uh, <clears throat> uh, now we are going to have a break in our question and uh, we are going to run uh, some polls. Uh, and uh, for the, the people uh, that we are following us in, in Uva, and we have uh, more than 600 people online, uh, the <clears throat> you ask you to go to uh, Slido and uh, you have the address, uh, uh, slido.com or uh, https uh, www.slido. And the code is uh, GLF Biodiversity. Uh, and, and, and we will have uh, uh, three questions. And uh, the first question is, uh, why is it important to mainstream biodiversity in forestry? And uh, you will have, uh, let's say a 60 seconds to reply in a couple of words. Uh, don't make a long discourse, it's going to be a word close. So three, four words. Why is it important to mainstream biodiversity in forestry? So prepare your answers. Another 30 seconds. And, and of course our panelists, they are also free to move to, to Slido. The first word is not surprising, sustainability. Because forests include 80%, I think it's missing is the biodiversity, the terrestrial biodiversity. Um, okay, let's let's uh, uh, have this uh, moving and and let's try to um, move to the second question. And the second question is a follow up, and then then, then because it is important, what what would be the most effective and promising means for mainstreaming biodiversity in the forest in forestry sector? And then again, I mean, a sort of please put your answer in in a couple of words so that it becomes a word cloud. We will wait for for one minute.
resilience ecosystem services, global health. Um, 30 seconds. Okay. And so let's move now to our final question. Um, that is uh, uh, not a work that question is, <clears throat> who are the most important actors for mainstreaming biodiversity? And I see that uh, some people have already started to answer. So you can choose up to three uh, choice. While uh, this one continue, can can we have the, the word cloud of, of the first question, uh, Michael? So it is important to mention biodiversity to stabilize forests, and in fact, it's all about resilience, sustainability, and ecosystem functioning, uh, and and mutual benefits. So clearly, uh, it is important to mention biodiversity in, in forest and forestry because otherwise there will not be uh, forestry. Um, still moving, but it's still resilient, sustainability and ecosystem services. Ecosystem functioning. The next question. Ah, it's interesting. What what is the most effective and promising means for mainstreaming biodiversity? Global health. That that's an unexpected one, but it's uh, quite interesting in the current context uh, of of the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, and and th there is an interesting paper that has just been published in, in NAS uh, that shows that in fact uh, by providing. Uh, uh, free health uh, coverage, uh, people have reduced uh, deforestation in, in, in some uh, protected area in Indonesia. So quite interesting. Integrated management, global health, ecosystem functioning. And, and we will use this, uh, this question in, in a study that, that we have started uh, with FAO, so we will continue. Um, and then in terms of the most important actor, The public forest administration, indigenous people, private forest owner, small order forester. So you, you can see that uh, clearly the, the people that seem to matter most are the people that are their feet on the ground. Huh? The, the international organization. Oh. Okay. Can we have back the, the last one, please? Uh, clearly, the most important actors are the ones that are directly uh, impacting on forest and acting in their management and getting resource from the forest. And then followed by research, which is interesting. Uh, it's, it's quite an interesting thing. So we are continuing the, getting the poll uh, via the Slido, but in the meantime, in our session, we will uh, start again um, 
our series of uh, uh, answer and, and question and answer. Um, and then I would like to ask um, uh, Professor Li Dikyang. Uh, you are a principal investigator in, in, in Chinese Academy of Forestry and, and you are also the director of uh, the key laboratory on biodiversity conservation on the state forestry and grassland administration. From your experience, I mean, what should be the priority for biodiversity conservation and, and, and what action and what's the role of local community? Professor Lee? Uh, we still not hear you. We are seeing your slide, but we are not hearing you. Professor Lee, we have a problem of, we are not hearing you. We are seeing your slides, but there is no sound. And, and the slides are a bit too wordy to, to read the slides online. So while we try to fix uh, the, the problem that is uh, facing by our colleague in China, uh, let, let's move to, to, to the next, uh, uh, a question, and, and that will be the question addressed to uh, Chantal Marie Nissen, who is the head of <clears throat> the unit on environment, natural resource, and water uh, in uh, what is called uh, DEFCO. Uh, the European Union has been supporting for a long time the work on biodiversity in tropical forests with flagship programs like ECOFAC, uh, the Sustainable Wildlife Management. Uh, and can, can you give us an idea of what, what are the future orientation of DEFCO in, in this field of forestry? Um, thanks, Robert. I hope you can uh, you can hear me. Um, yes, very well. Okay, good. Um, so I think maybe go back a bit. Um, first, say that you know we echo fact the program's been going for for thirty years, and uh, it produced the first forest management plans in in Central Africa in in nineteen ninety five. What's really good for us in, in the forest uh, sector in, in DEVCO is that our Commissioner for International Partnerships, uh, Yuto Pilainen, uh, she's decided that in fact, uh, forests will be one of her five legacies when uh, she leaves in five years time. So I think the pressure is on for us um, to, to show how we're doing, um, how we're protecting and, and sustainably managing um, forests. Meta mentioned that 80% um, of terrestrial species live in forests. They're highly complex uh, ecosystems. We also know that 1.6 million of the most vulnerable people actually depend on, on forests for energy, um, food, water, medicines, etc. So they're really important for, for development. Um, you'll know that over the past 20 years, we've been working on the Forest Law Enforcement Governance and Trade Action Plan to combat illegal um, logging. And everything that we do to prevent illegal practices also protects some um, species um, uh, from, um, from extinction or, or, or disappearance. And we can think of Aphromosia or Rosewood that are in the in CITES. Um, it also helps FLEG to improve governance. Um, it gets people to actually talk to each other, different stakeholders. In Honduras, where we're going to be signing a VPA, probably in, in December, um, we've got indigenous peoples around the table. We've got, for the first time, human rights being, um, being recognized that are also extremely important for forests and, uh, and their biodiversity. But um, timber, which is really what is covered under FLEGD, isn't the only thing. And uh, again, Meta and you, Robert, mentioned the uh, Sustainable Wildlife Programme, which we, uh, we finance and that uh, Philippe, who's going to be talking uh, this afternoon, um, is, is working on with all of you. Um, and that recognises the importance of other aspects of forests, the wild meat, the wild foods for the most vulnerable people. Um, but we also think that 
some forests are really, you know, that their, their ecosystems are so valuable that we really need to be protecting them. We can think of Lopé in, in Gabon, or the Thai forest in the Côte d'Ivoire, or the Asian uh, heritage um, parks. But we shouldn't just be looking at them as, as protected areas, we need to take them in, in their landscape. And I think that there, the program that C4 is, is managing, the forest program in Yangambi, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, with all of the, the, the research that um, you're setting up again in this, uh, in this old research center and the activities of conservation are, are really important. And I think we saw it from the Slido um, questions just now. The fact that you're you're not only doing research but agroforestry, you're testing um, new small-scale agriculture and also different forms of the production of, of energy. That's really important for everything that we do on on forests and and biodiversity. Now, what can we propose for the future? Well, one of the other areas that our commissioner is really interested in is education. Um, and training. And we really think that human capacities, we need to continue to, to support them. They can be very weak in a, in a lot of countries that we're working in. And we meet, need to make sure that we've got reliable information, again, research um, uh, and information systems to, to make sure that decision makers, they actually have the right data so that we're taking fact-based decisions. Um, I think that's really important for forests and, and, and biodiversity, and it's certainly something that we want to, to see. Then we think we need to be thinking um, globally. We need to have a coherent forest and biodiversity policy. And, and that's why we're going to be proposing a concept of forest partnerships. We're in discussion with, um, with partner countries at the moment um, in, in a sort of a, during our, our programming phase. The forest partnerships, the, the idea is that we're, we have a comprehensive approach so that we're looking at protecting, restoring, but also sustainably managing um, the forests. And we will be looking at forests, you know, from a biodiversity, from a climate change, and also from an economic um, perspective in this new instrument. At the moment, we've got about 10 countries that are, are, are really interested and 16 others that are taking on um, different aspects of uh, forest partnerships. So we're going to be talking with them um, in the coming months. And, uh, and maybe our, our expectation from this, uh, this webinar, because we're, in, we're at the end of our current financial framework and because we're, we're sort of slowly entering the, the new financial framework. We're, we're listening to you for ideas, and that's it, Robert. Over okay. to you. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, while we continue trying to fix uh, Professor Lee, and because uh, there is a, an interesting link to make with a protected area, uh, David, as an executive director of the Wildlife Conservation Society, you, you know certainly the importance of protected area. You also know that protected area cannot be covering the whole ground and there is an importance of protecting also the biodiversity outside of protected area. Okay. What is your experience? Can, can you tell us, especially for the Congo Basin, for example, what the WCS has done in terms of ensuring that biodiversity is also conserved outside of protected area? Uh, thank you, Robert. That's an excellent question. You know, the, the simple answer is that forests not categorized as protected areas can and do play an essential role in conserving forest biodiversity and ecosystem services. But, you know, I, I think they lack the recognition and support they deserve, partly because of the overly narrow definition of what is a protected area. IUCN recognizes six categories of protected area, and more recently, the CBD has defined other effective area-based conservation measures. Uh, basically, OECMs are protected areas where nature conservation may not be the primary objective. I think that these other places could get more political support and financial support if we really rethought the definition of protected areas. What if we define protected areas broadly as those ecological spaces where people individually or collectively take action to ensure the persistence of those parts of nature that they value? This means, of course, that government-run national parks and forest reserves are protected areas. 
but it would also mean that indigenous territories, community conservancies and locally managed marine areas would also be recognized as protected areas. Private lands managed in ways that conserve nature would also be recognized as protected areas. And even strangely, commercial forest concessions with provisions to protect endangered species and ecosystem functions could also be uh, recognized as protected areas. These different types of protected areas provide different balance points between biodiversity conservation and human use. Let me give you an example around indigenous territories as protected areas. I've worked with indigenous peoples in Central Africa and Central and South America for 30 years. And I've seen with my own eyes how vigorously all protect the territories to prevent outsiders from stealing from them. In Central and South America, where the rights of indigenous peoples are recognized and protected, the rate of forest clearing and forest fires in indigenous territories is considerably lower than in state managed protected areas. In Central Africa, the territorial rights of indigenous peoples and local communities are only slowly now becoming recognized, but are still rarely enforced. I believe really strongly that supporting indigenous peoples in Central Africa to protect their traditional lands and prevent bad actors from cutting their trees and killing their wildlife would vastly expand the area of protected forest in the Congo Basin and provide political support and financial support for indigenous people's efforts to protect the forest. Now quickly moving to talking about commercial logging in, in Central Africa. I think a great example is the logging company Congoli Industrial du Bois. It has 2 million hectares of forest concessionary rights in Northern Republic of Congo. Consumer pressure to purchase only environmentally green and ethically sourced products has, for, has encouraged CIB to expand the certification of its concessions under environmental and humanitarian good stewardship rules. So we must ask, is CIB's 1.8 million hectares of FSC certified concession also should it be recognized as a protected area? If so, what can be done to encourage certification of all commercial logging in Central Africa? I think that by recognizing more categories of protected areas to conclude sustainably managed indigenous territories, private land holdings and commercial concessions, we would draw political and financial support towards them and begin to truly mainstream biodiversity in the forest sector. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, David. And then, David, you are like me. I mean, you, you should uh, put your clock back to it because we have been claiming for 40 years that we have been working for 30 years. So uh, now we are going to ask uh, a question uh, to uh, Pablo Pacheco, uh, who is the WWF Global Forest Lead Scientist. Um, there are now tools and incentives to integrate carbon consideration in policies and decisions, but what about biodiversity? What metrics, what tool, and what incentives? And Pablo will answer the question via a video. Thanks for the question. Indeed, there has been a significant global effort to acknowledge the role of forests in climate change mitigation. Yet, while there has been good progress in defining MRB guidelines, institutional mechanisms to advance compensation options, and there are ongoing efforts to enhance the role of forests in indices, we are still lacking the necessary incentives and financial resources for embracing actions with the scale and the speed needed. With regards to biodiversity, current events have made us realize that people health and our planet health are inter intertwined and that we are facing a serious crisis. This is making us realize that our relationship with nature is broken, which is stimulating calls for rethinking our economic system and embrace wider economic and societal transformations. In the climate agenda, carbon became the most important aspect to, ter to care about when looking at forest dynamics, and the rest became co-benefits. The discussion on biodiversity deals with different facets that it has in terms of preserving genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystems diversity. As recently analysis argues, we should keep in mind that this discussion also includes three dimensions that are distinct, complementary, and often trade off with each other, which are conserving nature, using it sustainably, and sharing its benefits equitably. The metric and incentives which we embrace should not be dissociated from the discussion on targets. 
The CBD has announced that none of the 20 IT targets for biodiversity it set in 2010 has been reached and only six have been partially achieved. Thus, we have to keep asking the question, why have efforts to conserve biodiversity have not been effective enough and how we can reverse the forces working against? We and others have been working across a different range of initiatives that tackle the roots of these problems, yet are not enough since wider collective action is needed. Our multiple efforts range from building local term financial mechanisms for sustaining protected areas, facilitating community-led conservation, supporting corporations in embracing science-based targets, including land and biodiversity, enhancing connectivity in high biodiverse landscapes, as well as building partnerships for restoration with impacts at scale. We are also harnessing on the power of technologies for species tracking and monitoring and inform local actions. But this is not enough. A recent analysis suggests that for bending the curve of terrestrial biodiversity loss, there is need of embracing an integrated strategy, as well as concerted efforts, not only to increase the extent of land and their conservation management and restore degraded land, but also for their sustainable intensification and trade, reduce food waste and more plant-based human diets. The IPBS has also made a call for wider transformative change in our economic and financial systems and tackling poverty and inequality, which includes directing finance for payments linked to social and environmental metrics, along with corporate action. The metrics that we use have to be comprehensive, acknowledging the interdependence of ecosystems, species, genetic diversity, and nature contributions to people. Embracing a holistic approach offers the opportunity to design policies and actions contributing to multiple goals simultaneously. The scope of this metric should look across the gradient from natural to managed forests. This responds to the need to conserve forests for their positive impact on biodiversity, to enhance forest management for stabilizing further losses, as well as restoring forests and enhancing connectivity to support biodiversity recovery. Yet, much more attention should be given to assessing the quality of conservation, management, and restoration. But as critical as it is, having the right metrics for assessing genes, species, and ecosystems, integrity, and nature contributions to people, is to have in place the processes that ensure wider participation of different societal actors to commit to the achievement of those targets. Holistic approaches informed by science might pave the way for collective action and transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. <clears throat> it was recorded even though time. Uh, uh, now, I don't think that we have fixed the problem with our Chinese colleagues. So we will move to Andrea, uh, our youth representative. And uh, Andrea, I mean, working with local NGOs uh, and uh, international colleagues, to project develop inclusive and participatory project in, in El Salvador. What is your experience and what is your view on the role of local communities and, and indigenous people and, and how can we facilitate uh, biodiversity mainstreaming in their action? Andrea? Thanks. Hi everyone for every part that you are watching this. And thanks, Robert, for this important question and allow me to give my answers. I share the vision that local communities, indigenous people, as well as small scale producers, including especially women and youth, are the custodian of biodiversity. It means that they have the responsibility for protecting, taking care, and keeping in good conditions the biodiversity. But communities are also defenders. They should also make and enforce decisions and rules about their territory through a functioning governance institutions. For answering the second question, I would say like first, it's important that we should build and have a clear and shared definition of community participation. There is a deep and close connection between communities and their territory. And we need to have a clear vision about their system. We should ask more often to our communities why do they do these activities? What is the meaning behind them? And listen carefully. We must recognize their knowledge and experience and value them. If we can understand their system, we can work as a team. However, I think understanding is just a piece of the puzzle. Recognition is another one. We must promote and encourage high level of empowerment. That means 
the community should be part of the decision making processes. Examples in Latin America with ESCASU agreement provides communities more participation in environmental matters. Unfortunately, mostly of the government did not ratify this agreement. It's clear that our communities are those who identify their needs, but they also should be there to propose their solutions. And effective and inclusivity participation is needed now more than ever. And with the channels to this participation do not exist in our countries, the civil society and the government should support and create those mechanisms for such participation occurs. This also include like land tenure rights of indigenous people, local communities and women. Besides, I would like to add like any nationals and local government must mitigate and eradicate external threats like forest fire, narco trafficking and other illicit activities that can damage not only biodiversity, but also the culture and tradition in our communities. Without a real commitment from our authorities, our communities will not be adequately supported. And finally, but perhaps the most challenging one, we should foster different forest governance, like forest concessions and co-management. Cases of success globally are demonstrated that when communities have the adequate tools, the support and the legal protection, the forest remains and the biodiversity as well. Community roots are entangled with forest roots. If we fail to one, we fail both. So thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. <clears throat> and uh, it seems that we are still not um, uh, online with our colleagues from China, but uh, uh, we are working on it uh, in the background. So we will move to, to a second round of questions, which are questions from the audience. And, and I will ask uh, uh, our colleagues that have uh, put the question to, to put their video on <clears throat> and, and they, they will have a, a maximum of two minutes to ask their question. And uh, I will start by <clears throat> uh, Jennifer, uh, who is a local uh, indigenous knowledge specialist and it is now in the global, uh, not in, global in the Green Climate Fund. Uh, Jennifer, up to you. Um, hello, and uh, thank you very much to C4 for the invitation to participate in this discussion and the opportunity to listen to our distinguished panelists today. Now, at the Green Climate Fund, we also invest in the importance of biodiversity in forests as part of nature-based solutions for climate. And as we've heard from Andrea and others, Indigenous peoples and local communities whose lives are interwoven with forests are a very important part of these solutions. Now at GCF, the mandate is to drive paradigm shift, and this includes consideration of Indigenous peoples and readiness and project finance. Uh, so we have an Indigenous peoples policy, and one of the objectives is to work towards recognition and respect of traditional knowledge and livelihood systems in our activities. This objective is rooted in the body of evidence, including from IBBS and IPCC, that highlights importance of indigenous and local knowledge systems in achieving global goals on biodiversity and climate change. Yet there are still many barriers. How to support and implement transdisciplinarity, um, you know, bringing together um, indigenous knowledge and science and acknowledging that there is a historical marginalization of um, these peoples and communities who hold these knowledge system, how do we build and support their participation? This is why sharing of experiences and bringing them together is so important. So for example, here at the fund, some of the activities undertaken through our accredited entities range from supporting um, forest peoples to articulate the life plans to building in traditional knowledge as part of meteorological observation. So giving this framing, reaching into the rich experiences of your organizations, uh, my question to our panelists is, what do you think are some of the ways to ensure that indigenous and local knowledge are also part of an inclusive strategy for sustainable use and conservation of biodiversity? And are there any examples, quick examples or data sets that you would like to highlight uh, from your respective regions or organizations in support of this? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let, let's move to uh, Cecile. Cecile from Yaoundé. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you all for your presentations. As um, Andrea said, and also Mete and just Jen has said, we recognize more than uh, ever the role of rural women and indigenous women and local communities in forest management and biodiversity conservation. But there are a lot of barriers to promote that role, to improve the contribution 
of that target group, rural women, indigenous women and local communities into forestry and biodiversity mainstreaming or conservation. How do you think, how do you plan? What are your mechanisms? What are the strategies you have developed or you are developing to improve the participation of rural women, indigenous women and local communities into biodiversity conservation? This is the how, please, which is lacking. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, now, uh, uh, <clears throat> While Alice will turn on a video, I will ask Plinio to put a, a bit of a gender balance uh, in, in this set of questions uh, to ask his question. And to unmute himself. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> uh, I'm from Sirad and uh, I'm a tropical forest ecology. I've been working for more than 30 years in uh, how to uh, manage uh, sustainably uh, natural forests. My question is that knowing that in tropical regions, natural forests are still the main source of timber and wood, and that most of the, uh, of the studies looking at the sustainable uh, long-term um, timber production show that on the present regulation, the logging intensity and the uh, rotation cycles are too uh, short to be uh, on the long term sustainable. Uh, how do you see the natural forest management practices to be changed if we want to both have a sustainable production of timber while maintaining a high stock uh, of biodiversity? Thank you very much. Uh, important question. Uh, then <clears throat> let's move to. Uh, um... Teresita, what is your question? Gracias. Voy a hacer mi pregunta en español. Uh, yo trabajo en la Asociación de Comunidades Forestales de Petén en Guatemala, justamente en el modelo que Andrea mencionaba sobre concesiones comunitarias trabajando con el bosque y la experiencia que tenemos con el tema de biodiversidad es importante también desde el punto de vista de la investigación que respalda todas las acciones del manejo forestal que a veces es puesto en duda pero que ya realiza importantes eh, contribuciones a, al tema de la biodiversidad. Um, no sé si Robert quiere traducir eso primero antes de hacer la pregunta. Continue. Okay. So, Matt, uh, Teresita is, uh, is a member of a, a community uh, 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 association in uh, Petén and Guatemala. And if I read correctly, our question in English is what are the economic measures and institutional environment could help community forestry um, enterprises to maintain biodiversity? Uh, Sí, perdón, no había hecho la pregunta todavía, pero es esta que en español, que medidas económicas y eh, entorno institucional podría ayudar entonces a las empresas forestales comunitarias a integrar la biodiversidad. Ok, thank you. And, and sorry, Teresa, my, my, my Spanish is, is very limited, so <laughs> try to. Uh, now we have the last question. Uh, Alice, that will uh, tell us uh, a question. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, I'm Alice from the Aircraft Gene Bank, Aircraft C4 Gene Bank. And thank you for giving me a chance to interact with the distinguished panelists. You have all hinted on the issue why we need to do the uh, work on the conservation and streaming it in the biodiversity within forestry. But there is one aspect which I feel that has been left behind. We all know that when we go or when the, uh, the forest uh, products are being harvested, they always go for the best material, that they go for the timber, the best fruit, the fast growing. And then the material that is left behind, of course, will be of inferior genotype. So we end up having the genetic erosion and genetic drift. And finally, this is the 
uh, we may not have immediate uh, consequences, we may not see the immediate consequences of such removal of such genotypes, but in the long run, there may be some effect. This is the diversity that is important to help the species cope with the change emerging threats such as the diseases, the pests, and drought. So my question is, how are we going to ensure that there is sustainable use and management of the forest genetic resources to bring in the intraspecies diversity conservation in the strategy for mainstreaming, mainstreaming the biodiversity in forestry? Thank you. So to our panelists, you have a very easy set of questions. I mean, one is about uh, how do we integrate indigenous knowledge as part of sustainable use? How do we make sure that uh, we support smallholder and, 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 and women in, in, in forestry, in sustainable forestry? Um, how sort of economic measure and institutional environment could help community forest enterprise? Uh, how are we going to produce the timber we need for the boy economy uh, in a really sustainable way? We need some new management system. And finally, how, how do we make sure that we are not going to exhaust the genetic diversity and, and, and we keep this very important element in terms of it? So each of the panelists can choose uh, one question or two questions, uh, but uh, has two minutes to reply and, and we will start in reverse order and we'll ask Andrea. I'm sure you are interested by the community forestry one. Thank you to all who made the questions. They are very important because highlight different aspects, but I will try to respond to answer uh, to the question that Cecil said in a combination with uh, Maria Teresita mentioned. I would say like communities have already, mo men, most of them, they have already assisted how they develop the participation. They are organized and we should incorporate this organization in the way that we make decisions. They already have systems and this system I have proved that they have worked in some, in many cases around the world, and which are included. Besides that, in talking about uh, what, mentioned, what Teresita asked, I would say like we should create markets for those, uh, for those products that are um, producing in this forestry management. We should identify markets for non-timber product products, but also for those that they produce, and promote the local consumption. We should support our local communities as well. It's not about just leaving them all the responsibility or uh, nationals and local governments should implement adequate tools, but also they should promote these markets to be effective, they should be fair, and they will be inclusive for all. It doesn't mean indigenous communities, women and youth sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. David, what, what will be your answer to some questions? I, I really like the, the, the first question about how do we try to uh, ensure uh, effective engagement of Indigenous peoples in, in, in decision making around forest use. Uh, wonderfully simple task that we could do tomorrow afternoon. One of the really most complicated things to do. When, you, when, when Indigenous peoples in many countries aren't, aren't even recognized as citizens, how do you how do you engage indigenous peoples in national decisions around forestry? When, colonial, when, when countries inherited colonial laws that took lands away from indigenous peoples and vested all forest ownership in the state, how do you engage indigenous peoples in, in forest management? When the state believes the forest belongs to the state, I think these are incredibly difficult things. In, from WCS's perspective, the way that we do that is to, is to commit a long-term commitment to working with, with Indigenous partners. So we, we're not conservation tourists. We don't leave the capital city, go out to a community, spend three days and disappear. We're there for 20 years. And I think that long-term engagement and being an interlocutor between a politically, uh, geographically isolated and politically um, marginalized community, bringing community concerns and interests through WCS to, to the government, uh, I think is one of the ways that we've successfully brought indigenous voices into national government uh, decision-making with, with the intent of strengthening our indigenous partners' voices themselves. But as you know, initially, many indigenous communities are highly, highly marginalized politically and I think they do need strong 
interlocutors who can take their message effectively to government. Thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, Chantal, what kind of the question inspired you? Well, I'm afraid uh, it's the same one as, as David. It's an, um, on indigenous um, peoples. Um, These are the anthropologists. Uh, Talking. I'm sorry. Yes, um, I think, but my answer is a little bit different um, to to David's because we've been testing. I mean, thanks to to Honduras um, and the negotiations we had with them on the forest law enforcement of EPA, we've introduced the free prior informed consent for the very first time in a, a trade agreement on on illegal logging but also the way that they negotiated with us, um, with all the stakeholders, including indigenous peoples around uh, the table. Um, we're, we're now using this model to replicate it with uh, other negotiating partners who want to come to the table on, on VPAs. So that's one of the ways we're actually embedding it now into our trade agreements on illegal, um, illegal logging. The second way is this new initiative that we want to set up, the Nature Africa, um, the landscape approach to, to biodiversity conservation, where we're not only wanting to conserve high, uh, you know, high uh, value ecosystems, but we're also wanting to protect the communities that are in, dependent on them. And it's the same with the Green Sahel which you would know as the Great Green Wall, where we want to work at a very local level with local um, communities uh, um, based on their needs and, and also their knowledge. So the new approaches that we're taking um, under the, the, the next programming cycle. Um, and then uh, Robert, the program that we want to set up with you, the sort of the regeneration of this old program that was known as the Avenir des de Peuples des Forêts Tropicaux, um, I think that we should really be taking into, into account the, the, the question that we got um, about indigenous knowledge and see how we can embed that into this, uh, this new program, because that's the whole idea, is research um, uh, indigenous peoples, how do we make sure that they are better um, you know, included in all the programs that, that we do, what do we need to do, what are the aspects that we need to look at. So a good question um, and something that we can work on in, in the future. Thank you. Uh, well, what, what are the view of uh, uh, the Norwegian uh, Development Agency in terms of the, the question? Well, <clears throat> as a political scientist, I'll turn to the last question on incentives and, and, um, and mainstreaming from Alice. But, but just a brief uh, 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 note on also the first question from Jan, because of course, I mean, we find we are totally agree that community engagement and ownership is, is essential. And we also find it that forest management by lo local groups have higher biodiversity and, and less deforestation for sure. And we do a lo lot of work with that. Uh, we have just had a, a huge um, uh, a round of proposals from civil society uh, where we work a lot with civil society. I think more than 250 applications from 30 odd something countries. And we try to channel a lot of resources locally. But I think that both working locally and systemic at the same time is uh, essential. So, so we do uh, have as a main approach to to work with governments to, to do measurement and to work with the laws and land use and, and these kind of systemic things. And increasingly, we are also working uh, with the corporate sector, with, with business uh, on, on incentives, and especially in the, in the, uh, um, in the agro business and, and on food systems, where I do believe that, that changing the incentives for how they do and work with land use is absolutely essential to get anywhere. And, and I, if I were to, um, to, to turn a bit directly to what, what can we do, how, how to mainstream biodiversity, I think there are two interesting discussions going on. One is about the concept of nature risk, which kind of resembles climate risk, which more people have heard about. It's about the inherent risk for companies or governments or, or institutions 
that biodiversity loss can can produce, uh, whether it be directly on their future revenues, or it's through rain patterns or or you know, changes in agricultural patterns and so on. And actually understanding and calculating uh, that is is now that there's a movement in that direction. And the other is uh, that I've seen <clears throat> come up, you know, up as a discussion in some countries. It's about some call it nature neutrality, you know, but others just call it nature replacement. But that that it the, the cost of just using land in itself and building building in uh, natural habits and so on it, that has to have a cost. And and that uh, uh, when you when, uh, if you do that, uh, it should it should uh, either have yeah have a cost or be or or be um, be uh, uh, or um, uh, th that you should invest in another area in, in, instead. And those kinds of di discussing those kinds of mechanisms is, uh, I think, vital uh, as to create incentives to retain forest and other natural areas. In addition to working to uh, uh, empower local communities and so on. Thank you. <clears throat> and then while we are in the, in the political side, I mean, there's a lot of... Gervais, what, what's the COMIFAC uh, is having in terms of this question? Voilà. Merci, Robert. Je tente d'activer mon micro. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's important to emphasize from a uh, political side that for instance, when we come up with Central Africa in Congo Basin region, we have, for instance, the guideline for the involvement of IPs and CSOs in the forest management in the Congo Basin. And I can hope that more than 90% of our laws in regulation of countries leave space for participation of IPs and CSOs. And we have as well this regional network for, for IPs and for CSOs. And we can ask them, what is blocking this one? Why they are not taking over to try to push involvement and participation of IPs and CSOs need cost. It is a cost to do this and then we need resources for this uh, category of stakeholders. They must take their responsibility. They need to build their capacity to try to use as best as possible this space that government and regional institutions are given to them. Regarding the management space of natural forest concessions, I think that it's easy for us to try to encourage the certification aspect because when we have this certification, we hope that it is take a part of the sustainable management forest. Thank you, uh, Robert. Thank you, uh, no. <clears throat> Going back to uh, some global player like, like the CBD, uh, Alexander, uh, what is the question you feel that you can answer? Thank you, Robert, and thanks for uh, all questions. All of them are actually relevant to the CBD as a global international instrument. I think I just would uh, like to remind that uh, Convention on Biological Diversity has several objectives equal objectives. And one of them is sustainable use, which uh, goes very often hand in hand with conservation. And the focus on sustainability of the ways and means we use forests very often can actually lead us to conservation efforts as well and get conservation results. And that is really important when we think about management practices. And if we like to improve management practices, then actually the whole issue of mainstreaming also in the sense uh, Meta started her intervention today. So bringing and mainstreaming biodiversity into decision-making and forestry at different levels. And it's not only as was shown and the uh, questioner today also uh, coming from the top. So that should come from the bottom as well. And that's definitely where the importance of indigenous peoples and local communities is important. And as you know, convention is probably a pretty unique international instrument, 
which has a special platform for uh, this kind of uh, discussions. While of course, as a convention, our primary role is to ensure that there are political instruments, but also some technical and scientific evidences, which may help indigenous and people and local communities to be actively engaged through the platform as CBD, but also bringing those uh, guidelines and those ideas and those mechanisms into other structures. And for partners, including NGOs, we definitely will expect that they will work closely with indigenous peoples, but also with governments to ensure that all instruments and mechanisms and tools available through the convention are actually implemented on the ground and not forgotten, where we know that 196 parties basically adopting those tools made their political commitments to make it happen and to make it work. But that requires support at different levels by all partners. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, now back to the first, uh, that is now the last, Mete. Thank you, Robert. Uh, it's very difficult to come last because most of what I wanted to say has already been said. But I think this issue of making sure that we connect the local with the global is so important that I do want to spend a little bit of time just talking about that. And we've heard many examples of how we can involve local communities, indigenous people at the local level. It's not easy, but we have the instruments. We know what we need to do. Uh, what is much more difficult is to make sure that they have that voice at the national level and at the international level. And you heard example from David where he's talking about, yes, we can use interlocutors to interact with the government. And that's a very good example. But we also need to do that essential capacity building of forest user groups, forest and farm producer organizations, the existing cooperatives that are there to make sure that they get that voice and can use that at the national and at the international level. And clearly we need to make sure that they have the possibilities to do so. Uh, Alexander talked about the platform that's under CBD, which is a fantastic instrument and a way of doing that. We make sure that we have indigenous people, civil society organizations represented in the steering committees of our big programs. And uh, Robert, as you know, we're working together with C4 to do a review of mainstreaming biodiversity in forest sector. And here there's an opportunity for everybody to come with examples of best practices and policies but also asking those questions and saying, what else needs to come in here? So you do have an opportunity to help shape that going forward. Uh, I think also we have an opportunity now because we have a session like this. There are many other sessions going on virtually and therefore we don't have the problem of people not having the funding to attend. In some cases, of course, they don't have the internet connection or they have a very poor one as I do. Uh, but there is an opportunity now to have a little bit more of, of a better way of involving more stakeholders in the conversation. I think we need to take advantage of that and make sure we don't let that um, disappear after the, the pandemic is over. So there are many opportunities of how we can do this. And I think we need to look at how we can even further uh, facilitate that access and enhance the capacity to take advantage of that going forward. Because it is so essential that we find solutions that means that we have both positive outcomes for both biodiversity and people. And that has that incredible need for a balance between conservation goals and demand for resources that support livelihoods. And that's essential. And that's what we wanna do with the mainstreaming biodiversity into forestry agricultural sectors at large. Thank you. Um, there, there, there is about uh, more than 800 people that are following this session currently uh, uh, on UVA. Uh, and, and, and they have also a, a series of questions, but we have covered quite a lot of the, uh, the question, but uh, it's about the role of indigenous people and local community, how to scale up certification, how, how far will it be practical to mainstream biodiversity conservation in forest management. So we will try to bring this answer uh, in a written form uh, or through the, through the WUVACHNET. 
Now we are reaching the end of the session, and and it's it's really uh, I mean to reflect on of what <clears throat> what Mete says. Is that I I can't imagine imagine the, the nightmare that it would have been to bring all the people that are currently online in, in the same place uh, for a meeting at a time. So I'm pretty sure that we will not have managed it. So so I, I think it it at the same time it's it's a terrible crisis, but uh, it has opened some opportunity in terms of. Uh, digital uh, in terms of uh, uh, wasting less carbon in travel and, and in terms of being able to bring people on the table. I think we should do more effort on that. That's certainly true. <clears throat> in, in terms of what, what has been uh, discussed today, I will not even uh, attempt to, to make a summary. I mean, uh, but, but it is very important to, to, to realize that uh, Clearly, what, what we have been seeing and we, we have been hearing is that unless you bring everybody, uh, every stakeholder uh, around the table uh, to discuss uh, biodiversity mainstreaming in, in terms of the forestry sector, we are unlikely to, to be successful. And it, it reminds me this quote that uh, I really much like from uh, an indigenous uh, people representative in one of the GLF, and he was saying, if you are not sitting around the table, you quickly end up in the menu. So I think it's something that's very important. I mean, so because if we don't manage to mainstream biodiversity conservation in forestry, if we don't manage to make a, a forestry something that is both uh, sustainable, ecologically speaking, but also sustainable economic, economically speaking and contribute to, to the bay economy, then we will see again, as Bart was saying, trees being cut because there are more value down than standing. And, and we should keep this in mind. We should keep the value of our forest standing. And for that, we should succeed on the thing that we have not been able to do so far, which is the conservation and the sustainable use of forest uh, for both uh, uh, biodiversity conservation, but also for livelihood, uh, for uh, uh, goods and services. Uh, and as of today, there is something like uh, 1 billion hectare of uh, <coughs> forest, uh, primary forest left. We should certainly must protect them. There is about 1.5 billion hectare of managed forest that are producing uh, wood fiber resources. And, <coughs> and if we want to produce more wood to, to replace concrete and steel by wood, we, we need to find a way to produce this wood either in the existing managed forest sustainably, or we need to have a serious work to do in terms of restoring the 2 billion hectare of forests that have been degraded and to restore them both for ecological services, but also for goods and, and products. So I think it's very important. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I strongly uh, encourage you to uh, keep contact with Vincent who has invited you because he's the one coordinating this study that we are starting with FAO on the role of uh, mainstreaming biodiversity into conservation. And it's something that will continue after the GLF and for the months to come. And we'll be very happy to have your views and uh, uh, your experience, uh, your knowledge, um, because that will be one way to put uh, all the people around the table. I think uh, we have finished. Uh, we managed to finish uh, on time, uh, in spite of the very packed agenda. Uh, thank you to all. Bear with me. Sorry if I've been rude in interrupting you. Uh, I would like to thank also the people on the background that you don't see but are making miracles, that Fabio, Michael, uh, uh, and, and all the others uh, in, in the GLF platform. And I will strongly encourage you to, to continue looking at the, the exciting uh, agenda uh, that is offered to us for, for the next two years. There is a session on sustainable wildlife management tonight. Uh, <clears throat> there are uh, many uh, things that are going on. So please stay with us, enjoy uh, the GLF. And we will put the uh, video sent by the Minister of Costa Rica in YouTube. Uh, so that people can still see it. Good morning to my dear colleagues of the Center for International Forestry Research. Uh, on behalf of the Costa Rican government and the Ministry of the Environment and Energy, it is a pleasure to address this global landscape 
forum and um, provide a view of what are um, the countries and the government's efforts in developing that uh, forestry economy that would foster and um, support and protect biodiversity. In, in that note, I would like to start by mentioning how Costa Rica, through the Axis 10 of its decarbonization plan, addresses um, forestry, the forestry economy. Framed with nature-based solutions as a center, it seeks to consolidate a management model for rural, urban, and coastal territories that facilitates the protection of biodiversity, the increase and maintenance of the forest cover and its ecosystem services through mainly nature-based solutions for our economy. The aim to, is to maintain forest cover and increase it up to 60% by 2030. This effort is um, in parallel to the maintenance and um, the extended protection of marine ecosystem and um, the enrichment of for urban areas and forested areas within those urban areas. Costa Rica began its um, forest transition economy a, a, a beyond the, the actual timber industry or the actual timber economy that used to be the center of the forest economy back in the early years. It began transforming this economy through the establishment of the payment, environmental payment systems, the, what we call PSA, Pago por Servicios Ambientales. The system has since um, the last century evolved from a strictly market-based um, solution for conservation into a broader development strategy. And in particular, it has focused lately in um, providing this um, type of market-based solution to indigenous territories and indigenous forest cover. That um, approach has evolved and is evolving currently to establish a, a specific type of environmental service payments for indigenous, what we call the indigenous payment for environmental services. This is being developed um, in collaboration with our eight indigenous peoples and um, the different um, areas that are under their governance. We expect to have a, um, this form of payment for environmental service develop within the next two or three years. Uh, along with the attention to indigenous forest lands, the role of uh, women in particular and the development of a gender-based plan has been among the most important evolutions in the environmental services uh, payment uh, system. And um, until now, the plan has proposed the, the role of women has evolved as an agent of conservation um, and it, it's um, changing a situation or it's attending a situation where when we started, almost 85% of all the farms that were being awarded the contracts of payment for environmental services were controlled by mail. And um, attending this major gap, this uh, broad difference, is one of the things that um, has been in the works and the evolution and the represent the evolution of um, the payment for environmental services. Another aspect that has been enhancing or that is uh, focused on enhancing our biodiversity 
uh, forest relationship is the development of the national biodiversity policy and strategy. This uh, biodiversity policy de derives from the work and the commitments of the country uh, regarding the um, biodiversity convention. And um, it, it has as well evolved through the negotiations and the process the country has followed in the different uh, meetings of the parties in the, in the biodiversity front. This strategy um, has um, put front and center for the next years the development of a nature-based solutions national policy um, as a way to implement those commitments that the country has um, established and has signed in at the um, international, at the, at the um, UN Biodiversity Convention and its, its different uh, treaties and, and, um, and protocols. In, that, in the combination of our, or both our biodiversity international policies and our climate commitments, the country has come to lead along with the uh, French government and the, and the French uh, Republic, the um, High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. This High Ambition Coalition aims to protect 30% of the world's biodiversity by 2030. And that leaves the country with the effort of extending not only the protection of the forest, which is close to 26% under public uh, control presently, and extending that uh, amount of conservation up to 30%, as well as doing the same effort at, um, in, the sea, in the sea, and uh, in, the, um, in the sea on, under the government's um, and, and the country's control. The protection of 30% of the planet should not only be seen as a quantitative goal, but as a qualitative goal as well. Um, it is critical to achieve our biodiversity outcomes. These uh, some of the crucial elements that must take into account are the effective management and the governance of these areas. In that sense, one of the most interesting interesting advances that uh, the country and that this administration is putting forward to Congress in the form of a bill, of a, of a uh, law bill, is um, the a new law that would facilitate granting titles over the rights to use forest, public forest areas, um, and that, that these titles will be transferable in, in, in a market, in the public market. These um, titles to public forests, titles to the right of use, they're not exactly private property titles because the property is, is, will continue to be in the government's hands, but the title over the use of these uh, lands would be something that would be transferable, that could be used as potential collateral for um, loans, and that would be part of the forest, would be become part of that uh, national forest economy. This um, granting such titles over the rights to use public forests will facilitate the um, the enhance or will it enhance the living conditions, the livelihoods of the uh, number of poor families that for an extended number of years have been um, squatting or occupying this uh, forest in our, some of our uh, coastal lands, our um, forest reserves, in other um, forest areas under government um, protection. So by granting, by establishing this type of um, right of and of title, we would give these people the opportunity to have a tool for um, their development.
And this is a critical issue, not only for that uh, forest economy, that is the interest of this um, meeting, but also for the livelihoods of the families that are living, currently living in these areas. Before I uh, leave, I would like to say a um, warm uh, salute to my friends at C4, Amy Duchel and uh, Peter Crunkleton that I'm that are most likely being watching this video. It's um, it's a pleasure to be part of this conference, and thank you very much for C4 for its organization. Thank you again. Uh, for your participation. Uh, thanks to the more than 800 people online for attending and asking the question, and we try to answer these. So uh, we didn't manage, unfortunately, to reconnect our colleague from China, but we, we will try to, to connect him, uh, uh, contact him offline and, and try to find out what happened and, and get his contribution too. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. I think that we can consider the uh, session completed. Bye.